Christopher Marlowe was an intensely incendiary human being. Like he, have you ever known one of those people that just like to put their finger in the wound of every, you know, and just try to, you know, just make it as not just like edgy, but way over the edge, you know, like intensely over the edge. Like I, I sometimes show, um, I sometimes show in my postmodernism discussions, I show some art by Delavoye. Delavoye is this guy that tattoos pigs for his art. He created a poop machine. It's a machine that, that creates, Christopher Marlowe was an intensely incendiary human being. Like he, have you ever known one of those people that just like to put their finger in the wound of every, you know, and just try to, you know, just make it as not just like edgy, but way over the edge, you know, like intensely over the edge. Like I, I sometimes show, um, I sometimes show in my postmodernism discussions, I show some art by Delavoye. Delavoye is this guy that tattoos pigs for his art. He created a poop machine. It's a machine that, that creates like the equivalent of human poop with chemical reactions and all this, and that's his art. I mean, it's just an incendiary type of art. There was, a, there was a guy named Maplethorpe who did all kinds of very anti-religious stuff, very uh, pornographic type of stuff. And uh, so I think of Christopher Marlowe kind of in that vein, and with Faustus especially. So let's go, let's go, let's talk about him real quick now. He's like that. Now, Christopher Marlowe is actually literally one of Shakespeare's uh, inspirations. Marlowe only wrote four point or four plays to speak of. Uh, the Jew of Malta becomes the virgin of uh, the virgin merchant of Venice. Uh, Edward the second from Marlowe becomes Richard the uh, third. Tamburlaine becomes Henry the fifth. So the I mean this is very influ influential stuff. And also uh, Marlowe is the first one to write in blank verse in his plays. Blank verse, as you'll remember, is unrhymed iambic pentameter. Settle thy studies, Faustus, and begin to sound the depth of that that thou wilt profess. Okay, so, so uh, and then Shakespeare emulated that in, in practically all of his, his plays. Okay, now, uh, Christopher Marlowe died I want to just really briefly, briefly, briefly touch on this topic that I don't know if you have seen it, but I would highly recommend watching it. It's a movie called Anonymous. Anybody seen it? Okay. Anonymous is a movie. It's spectacular, but it goes on the theory that Shakespeare didn't, the actor, William Shakespeare, didn't write the plays that are attributed to William Shakespeare. I think the theory has been pretty much debunked, but it's, it's, an, it's a very, very alluring theory. When you think about stuff like William Shakespeare, the actor, oh, he, he just has like a grammar school education. He's never been to Italy. How does that work? The, the world's greatest writer, almost undisputed, has never, I mean, has a grammar school education and never went to Italy and wrote Merchant of Venice, wrote Romeo and Juliet, wrote, I mean, there's a lot to be said for this. So that movie, that movie is awesome. It's amazing. It's a great movie. I recommend it highly. It's called Anonymous. And it tells the, the supposed tale of what would have been, what might have been the case if Shakespeare had not written the piece. Marlowe plays a plays a part in that movie too. So, so it's not, it's not history, but it's a damn good story. Okay. All right. So Marlowe died at age 29. If he had been in age 27, we could have lumped him in with, oh, Jim Morrison and Heath Ledger and all those types, but he, he made it to 29. Stabbed in the eye, supposedly over a bill in a tavern, but really it was probably more than that. He was accused of heresy. Imagine that and treason just days before. So he never married. And we're about to see why maybe. <laughs> the passionate shepherd to his love on page 678. 
Now, you guys, this is a love poem. Love poem. But it's written in the form of a pastoral. And a pastoral is literally a poem from one shepherd to another. Shepherd is like a rural people. I mean, you might think of something like uh, if you're in the court. Okay, how about the, you all seen Mean Girls, right? Come on, you've seen Mean Girls? Yes. So you might think of a popular crowd like that. You know, you might think of them as artificial, maybe. Might think of them as um, more art than substance. Fake, maybe, comes to mind. So if you're in the court, you might think of that as being full of politics and fake and, and everyone trying to one-up each other. And, and But the pastor, the, the common people, that's pure and true and good. They're more authentic. And so a pastoral is from one shepherd to another. And, and it's written, it has a certain, certain uh, form, six stanzas, written in couplets, and the couplets go A, A, B, B in rhyme scheme. Okay? All right, so let's read this. The, pa the passionate shepherd to his love on page 687. Come live with me and be my love. And we will all the pleasures prove that valleys, groves, hills, and fields, woods, and steepy mountains yields. And we will sit upon the rocks, seeing the shepherds feed their flocks by shallow rivers to whose falls melodious birds sing bedding dwellers. And I will make thee beds of roses and a thousand fragrant posies, a cap of flowers and a kirtle embroidered with all the leaves of myrtle, a gown made of the finest wool, which from our pretty lambs we pull, fair lined slippers for the cold with buckets of purest gold, a belt of straw and ivy buds with coral clasps and amber studs, and if these pleasures may thee move, come live with me and be my love. The shepherd swain shall dance and sing for thy delight each May morning. If these delights thy mind may move, then live with me and be my love. All right, so first ladies, ladies, does this work for you? The word trite comes to mind and it's also just, insulting a little bit because what are the things that he obviously the things that he uh promises let's skip the first two stanzas he says i'll make you a bed of roses and a thousand fragrant bouquets of flowers with the pun posy poet poems a thousand fragrant i'll write you poetry every day and i'll make you all these flower bouquets i'll make you a cap of flowers and a dress made out of embroidered with leaves of myrtle you know I'm allergic to that stuff, right? A gown of the finest wool that only the prettiest lambs. I mean, isn't it kind of uh, insulting? Like, oh, I'll give you a, ga a nightgown that only the prettiest lambs. I mean, I'll give you the f line slippers for the cold. And with, I mean, line 16 doesn't match to me. Buckets of purest gold. Where are you going to get, I mean, that doesn't make sense to me anyway. I think he's saying fair line slippers for the cold with buckles of the purest gold. Where are you going to get that? I mean, you're a, you're a pure, poor, like, anyway. Uh, a belt of straw and ivory buds with coral clasp and hand. Sounds like he's trying to buy you to me. And if these pleasures may thee move, come live with me and be my love. And every morning, this got me, like, this is what I was hoping for with my man when I get married to a guy. I want every morning the shepherd swains, the fiery young lovers, the country boys, basically. I want every morning for them to dance and sing in my yard every morning when I wake up. That's what I want. Okay. In the beginning, he, he, he promises this. We will feel all the pleasures, all the pleasures of the world prove with that, the alliteration. 
I mean, it sounds almost, to me, it's not an ugly sound. It sounds like kind of like a whisper. All the pleasures prove that valleys and hills and fields. And then in the end, he has the shepherd swain shall sing. That's sibilance, S, the S's. Okay. Now let's go to the direct reply by Sir Walter Raleigh. Page 527. <clears throat> it's a, almost a line for line reply. Now this is the nymph's reply to the shepherd. Sir Walter Raleigh is this real caustic person. He's an explorer, a poet, a scientist, this and that and all this kind of stuff. Um, real Renaissance man. But he's also very fiery and kind of mean. And uh, he ends up living out his life in the Tower of London. King James puts him there because he suspects him. Anyway, here's his reply. He's writing in the voice of a woman, the nymph's reply to the shepherd. And it goes like this. If all the world and love were young and truth in every shepherd's tongue, these pretty pleasures might me move to live with thee and be thy love. Time drives the flocks from field to fold when rivers rage and rocks grow cold and Philomel becometh dumb. The rest complains of cares to come. The flowers do fade and wanton fields to wayward winter reckoning yields. A honey tongue, a heart of gall is fancy's spring but sorrow's fall. Thy gowns, thy shoes, thy beds of roses, thy cap, thy kirtle, and thy posies soon break, soon wither, soon forgotten, in folly ripe, in reason rotten. Thy belt of straw and ivy buds, thy coral clasps and amber studs, all these in me no means can move to come to thee and be thy love. Could youth last and love still breed, had joys no date, nor age no need, then these delights my mind might move to live with thee and be thy love. Pretty stinging rebuke, I would say. So let's start from the beginning. He says, she says, fella, you know, you were in Starbucks, we're He's come to you from across the whole entire Starbucks, trembling, and he delivers his poem to you. I'll give you beds of roses. And here's your reply. Bella, if all the world were young and truth in every shepherd's tongue. So that line, too, is pretty devastating. He says, I've known some shepherds to lie before. You may be lying to me now. These pretty pleasures, pretty pleasures, you could almost take that synonymous with petty, petty, petty pleasures, pretty pleasures, might me move. So he even, he even emulates the alliteration with the pretty pleasures and then m -m 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 might me move, might me move, m -m 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 -m. to live with thee and be thy love. Time drives flocks from field to fold. Those Fs, now we're talking a more dark and sinister tone. <laughs> it's not happy. <laughs> flocks, <laughs> flocks from field to fold. What he's saying is that time rules us all. Time is the fire in which we burn. All these things you promised me will fade, will die. The rocks that we're sitting on beside the river and watching the shepherds, those rocks will grow cold. And the river, the bubbles and the brooks you're talking about and all the falls, they'll rage. And now it's a raging, flooding river. The rocks are cold and it's winter. And the nightingale becomes dumb, meaning not uh, speechless, quiet. And then everything beyond that 
point is just complaining. Oh, I wish. Oh, woe is me. Oh, flowers fade. <laughs> and wanton fields to wayward winter reckoning yield. So in other words, these beautiful fields you're talking about, winter's going to come. So you're trying to entice me with a honey tongue. But a honey tongue, that's fancy, that's spring's fancy. But a heart of gall, that's sorrow's fall. And I don't know what's the longest relationship you've been in, but sometimes people, yeah, I've known lots and lots of couples that have gotten married and they thought everything was going to be good and everything is, oh, when it comes to the child. And then what happens? Grow apart. Learn that they're not compatible. Learn that they can't sleep in the same, under the same roof without hating, you know. It's just maybe they have a different song to sing one. Maybe, maybe what was infatuation and lust and the butterflies, maybe that went away like the flowers dying. Maybe that went away and in its place, rage and resentment, hate. It happens, it happens. So many marriages are destined for horrible failures. It's about a third, about a third of them. Flowers fade. Um, your honey tongue will turn to a heart of gall. All those gowns and all that material stuff you talked about, all that stuff breaks and withers and is gone. That is in folly, right? Like that whole thing you promised me is in folly. Folly just means like a stupid mistake, right? Stupidity, basically. Folly. It's ripe with folly and rotten with reason. Wow. Now, if you were to analyze the tone of this, it's very, what would you say? In your face, incendiary, bombastic, I don't know, uh, combative. Incendiary comes to mind. In reason, rotten. The belt of straw, the ivy buds, the coral clasp, blah, blah, blah. None of these move me to, enough to come be your love. But, but, this is presumably what Sir, Ralti, Sir Walter Raleigh thought every tr maiden truly wants, truly wants. But, could youth last and love still breed? Had joys no date nor age no need. Wow, so could youth last? You know, during this time period, a woman's primary avenue to success was marriage. It's awful, but it was true. I mean, and so there was a narrow window in time. I mean, if a woman, if a young woman got into her 20s and was not married yet, she was considered a spinstress and unmarriable in her 20s. So, this is one of the first and of the great tradition of carpe diem poems. Seize the day. Yesterday is a dream and tomorrow's a lie. Today's the day. You're promising me tomorrow. You're, you're promising me all these things will, will make me happy through and through, but they'll all decay and die. That's rotten with reason, ripe with folly. What I really want is youth, my youth, my beauty, this flower to last forever. And for love to last forever. For there not to be a honeymoon phase. For the, the honeymoon phase to continue. Always be there. If joys didn't have an expiration date, didn't have an end, an age, no need. So if we could, if we could live forever happily, and be young and beautiful and in love, then, if you could promise me that, but you're promising me things that, that die. It's when you're young, you're constantly trying to get somewhere else, you know? Oh, when I get out of high school. Oh, when I get out of college. Oh, when I get married. Oh, when, you know what I mean? And it's like, this is not real life. I'm just a young person now and all that. But what you don't realize is that that's the, 
round zero, right? So carpe diem, seize the day, man. Make your life extraordinary. Today's the only day. You should do it. And I'm going to tell you exactly the opposite here in a minute with Faustus. But, but yeah, if you feel like you'd like to walk across Starbucks and talk to a person, you should do it. Why not? If you feel like you would like to go out with your friends, and the COVID is a whole other thing, okay? A whole other. But outside of COVID, you should do it. Because life happens not in this room, does it? It happens somewhere out there, right? Doesn't it? And it happens with your friends too, doesn't it? You know, the end of, um, the end of uh, what's that book? Great book, uh, Chris Machambliss, um, uh, Into the Wild. It ends with this wonderful thing. Happiness only valid when shared. Okay, so seize the day.